This recording is a little different. In a way, it combines the Audio Anarchy Books project with the Audio Anarchy Radio project. I think that a straight recording of Society of the Spectacle would be pretty impossible to listen to, since it's already pretty difficult to read. So really, this is a recording of people's thoughts about the book, and how we found that the writing in the book intersects with our lives. We all picked aphorisms that we liked, read them, and then talked a little about what they mean to us. The hope is that people find ideas interesting when they see how it relates to their lives, and that by listening to how other people see that relation, it might help make the text a little more inspiring for you. The capitalist production system has unified space, breaking down the boundaries between one society and the next. This unification is also a process, at once extensive and intensive, of trivialization. Just as the accumulation of commodities mass-produced for the abstract space of the market inevitably shattered all regional and legal barriers, as well as all those corporative restrictions that served in the Middle Ages to preserve the quality of craft production, so too it was bound to dissipate the independence and quality of places. The power to homogenize is the heavy artillery that has battered down all Chinese walls. Number 167. This society eliminates geographical distance only to reap distance internally in the form of spectacular separation. I've been thinking a lot about place recently, about what it is, what it was, what it could be, and my relationship to it. These days I'm learning about plants, so that's where my mind goes when I read this. Places used to be distinguishable by what grew there. Differences in factors like climate, topography, and soil composition led to differences in the plants of different places. These plants fed different animals who evolved along with them in systemic relationships that together defined places. These places didn't have names, and they didn't always have clear borders. There was some fluidity and limited movement between places as each element of the place, from microorganisms to megafauna, had an impact on the other elements and the system as a whole. The way I understand it, humans originated in one or a very few of the places and migrated over the course of thousands of years into almost all of the places on Earth. For most of this history, humans assimilated into existing places so that many different human cultures evolved from the same human ancestors. They ate different plants and animals, had different medicines, customs, taboos, social organizations, languages, religions, and leisure activities that were place-specific. Capitalism also originated in one or very few places and spread throughout the world. But its logic dictates domination rather than assimilation. People following this model can't integrate into place existing places with vast differences in both ecosystems and cultural systems. Capitalism is a mold that is forced onto places out of which it didn't evolve and within which it can't exist as a single element impacted by all other elements. It destroys the systemic relationships that define places and imposes its own mandates, which are not as rich and varied. The plants grown under capitalism are only plants that benefit humans in some way or make money. Um, not even all of them benefit humans, really. The most planted plant, I think, in the world are European grasses and people's lawns, which don't seem to me to have any kind of a clear benefit um, except to the people who sell them. I'm an heir of all this. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. I didn't understand the town I lived as a place. I didn't have any real relationships with the plants and animals around me. I didn't get my sustenance from my immediate surroundings. I didn't even know where my water came from. I didn't feel like an integral part of a cultural tradition. At the time, I thought that most of the people in my town were ignorant hicks and I couldn't relate to them. I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew I didn't care about what the people around me cared about and I wanted to get out. The various media I was exposed to showed me a world that seemed very different from mine. 
I thought my town lacked culture and that I could go out into this world I saw on TV and find it. Because place is so degraded, I was able to leave easily. I left in a van I could buy gas for anywhere in the country using my ATM card and my ability to speak English. I knew the traffic laws. I knew how to get food. I knew how to find an apartment and get a job. Migration is easier now than it was thousands of years ago. I felt freer than I ever had before. I came to San Francisco seven years ago. In many ways, it's different from the small town where I grew up. I have more access to a broader range of ideas and people and products, too, on that side of things. Through this and through my experience of living in the world outside my small town and noticing the differences between it and my expectations, I started to figure out what I want and what I care about. I've become more able to name my dissatisfaction. San Francisco is no more of a place than Ebensburg, Pennsylvania. I'm more comfortable here because I have the option of surrounding myself with people whose ideas and desires are more similar to mine. But I don't feel rooted here or anywhere else. I spend most of my time with people whose definition of community includes people all over the world with similar values. I can go to cities I've never been before and quickly find a house and a group of people that feels almost as much like home as most of the 13 places I've lived in San Francisco. In those moments, I find joy, beauty, comfort, and connection. But I also find a deep sadness in the knowledge that my ability to do this is a trade-off for not having the ability that every living thing had for thousands of years to truly be a part of an integrated systemic place. I fumbled a lot in the beginning. Um, and is it okay if I do four? <laughs> Okay, um, number 169. A society that molds its entire surroundings has necessarily evolved its own techniques for working on the material basis of this set of tasks. That material basis is the society's actual territory. Urbanism is the mode of appropriation of the natural and human environment by capitalism, which, true to its logical development toward absolute domination, can and now must refashion the totality of space into its own peculiar decor. I started gardening and learning a lot about plants, including the wild and feral plants in the Bay Area. I'm trying to get more of my sustenance from my immediate surroundings. I learned where my water comes from. Some friends and I restarted an abandoned four and a half acre urban farm. I'm trying to understand that four and a half acres as a place, but finding a lot of obstacles to that. It's owned by the City Department of Recreation and Parks, and the bureaucrats there don't let me forget that for them, it isn't a place. It's a property, it's a liability, it's a political tool, it's pieces of paper on their desks. I was there a few weeks ago with a friend and four people showed up, people I'd never seen before and I didn't know were coming. Um, they introduced themselves as architecture students in Berkeley. They're working on a project for a class and their project is designing an urban farm. It sounds exciting to me at first. Um, I set up and extended my hand in greeting um, and the most talkative of these people, um, recoiled from my dirty hand. I noticed his spotless white pants and the shiniest white shoes I think I've ever seen. And he talked to me a little bit about his project, and he asked me about mine. Um, he pointed to the fruit trees on the hills and was asking me about what fruit trees need to thrive. It's not what he said, though. He said, what do they need to produce more fruit? Um, I told him a little bit about it, including that they need you know, adequate amounts of sunshine, he said to me, so if we put artificial light on the, on the trees 24 hours a day, they'd produce more fruit? I didn't really know what to say. I realized that for him, it, this isn't a place either. Um, that tree is not part of any specific location. It's not part of any like system of anything that keeps it alive, that needs it, that it needs. I pictured it in a casino, in a big pot, in a big box retail store, someplace with no windows, lights on all the time. People can't tell the difference between day and night, neither can the tree. I tried not to vomit on his shiny white shoes. Number 168. Human circulation, considered as something to be consumed, tourism, is a byproduct of the circulation of commodities. Basically, tourism is the chance to go and see what has been made trite. The economic management of travel to different places suffices in itself to ensure those places' interchangeability. The same modernization that has deprived travel of its temporal aspect has likewise deprived it of the reality of space. What immediately springs to my mind 
and I guess this is probably a little bit cliche, is Las Vegas. I got dropped off hitchhiking in Las Vegas um, and decided I would try to spend the night there and see see what that felt like, see what it was like for just a day. Um, I got dropped off right on the strip, and of course it's huge structure after huge structure after huge structure, and they're all the same, and they're all there for the same reason, and you do the same things inside them, but they're all supposed to be um, representing you know, different cultures all over the world. There are all these like, larger-than-life, crasser representations of places that you could buy you know, airplane tickets to and go. Um, I was in Caesar's Palace. I was walking around, and there were these people... Um, walking near me who were speaking Italian, and I couldn't believe it. I, the people would travel that distance and across an ocean to a different continent to go to this place that just um, like cheapens everything from their culture and you know, turns it into something entirely different. Um, and I thought about that for a while, but it wasn't until after I got away from the, the bright lights and all the noise that I realized that looking at the replica of the Trevi Fountain in Caesar's Palace, I really didn't have that much of a different relationship to it than I did of the Trevi Fountain when I was in Rome. The fact that the anarchists regard the goal of the proletariat revolution as immediately present is at once the great strength and the great weakness of the real anarchist struggle. I refer to the struggle of collectivist anarchism. The claims of anarchism in its individualist variants are laughable. Collectivist anarchism retains only the terminal point of the historical thought of class struggle, and its unconditional demand that this point be attained instantly is echoed in its systematic contempt for method. Its critique of the political struggle consequently remains an abstract one, while its commitment to the economic struggle is framed only in terms of the mirage of a definitive solution to be achieved at one stroke on the economic battlefield itself, on the day of the general strike or insurrection. The anarchist agenda is the fulfillment of an ideal. Anarchism is the still ideological negation of the state and of classes, that is to say, of the very social preconditions of any separated ideology. It is an ideology of pure freedom, which makes everything equal and eschews any suggestion of historical evil. This position, which fuses all partial demands into a single demand, has given anarchism the great merit of representing the refusal of existing conditions from the standpoint of the whole of life, not merely from the standpoint of some particular critical specialization. On the other hand, the fact that this fusion of demands is envisioned in the absolute, at the whim of the individual, and in advance of any actualization, has doomed anarchism to an incoherence that is only too easy to discern. The doctrine requires no more than the reiteration and the reintroduction into each particular struggle of the same simple and all-encompassing idea, the same endpoint that anarchism has identified from the first as the movement's sole and entire goal. Thus Bakunin, on quitting the Jura Federation in 1873, found it easy to write that, quote, During the last nine years, more than enough ideas for the salvation of the world have been developed in the Internationale, if the world can be saved by ideas, and I defy anyone to come up with a new one. This is the time not for ideas, but for action, for deeds, end quote. No doubt this attitude preserves the commitment of the truly historical thought of the proletariat to the notion that any ideas must become practical, but it leaves the ground of history by assuming that the adequate forms of this transition to practice have already been discovered and are no longer subject to variation. I like this aphorism because I think that its criticism of anarchists is spot on and that anarchists who don't have a... a a clever or an interesting or a thoughtful response to this aphorism, uh, frankly, are living in the past.
67. Dissatisfaction that the commodity in its abundance can no longer supply by virtue of its use value is now sought in an acknowledgement of its value qua commodity. A use of the commodity arises that is sufficient unto itself. What this means for the consumer is an outpouring of religious zeal in honor of the commodity's sovereign freedom. Waves of enthusiasm for particular products, fueled and boosted by the communications media, are propagated with lightning speed. A film sparks a fashion craze, or a magazine launches a chain of clubs that in turn spins off a line of products. The sheer fad item perfectly expresses the fact that, as the mass of commodities become more and more absurd, absurdity becomes a commodity in its own right. Keychains that are not paid for, but come as free gifts with the purchase of some luxury product, or are then traded back and forth in a sphere far removed from that of their original use, bear eloquent witness to a mystical self-abandonment to the transcendent spirit of the commodity. Someone who collects keychains that have recently been manufactured for the sole purpose of being collected might be said to be accumulating the commodity's indulgences, the glorious tokens of the commodity's imminent presence amongst the faithful. In this way, reified man proclaims his intimacy with the commodity, following in the footsteps of the old religious fetishism with his transported convulsionaries and miraculous cures, the fetishism of the commodity also achieves its moment of acute fervor. The only use still in evidence here, meanwhile, is the basic use of submission. interested in purchasing a power book. Can I start by getting your name and phone number? Yes, uh, my name is Guy. Guy? Guy. G-U-Y. Why? Guy, okay. So I have the same middle name. And what's the last name, sir? Last name, Debord. D-E? D-E-B-O-R-D. Debord, okay. And what's your phone number, sir? Um, I don't have a phone number in this country. I live in Paris. Okay, no problem, sir. And now what exactly do you want to know about a power book? Yeah, so my question is that the satisfaction that the commodity, in this case the power book, in its abundance can no longer supply by virtue of its use value, is now sought in an acknowledgement... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying that the satisfaction that the commodity, in, in this case the power book, okay. in its abundance can no longer supply by virtue of its use value, is now sought in an acknowledgement of its value in the capacity of a commodity. A use of the commodity arises that is sufficient unto itself. What this means for the consumer, which is me, is an outpouring of religious zeal in order of the commodity's sovereign freedom. Waves of enthusiasm for particular products, such as the power book, fueled and boosted by the communications media, are propagated with lightning speed. A film sparks a fashion craze, or a magazine launches a chain of clubs that in turn spins off a line of products. The sheer fad item perfectly expresses the fact that, as the mass of commodities become more and more absurd, absurdity becomes a commodity in its own right. So basically, my question is that if I buy this power book, will I be consumed by religious zeal, and will I become intimate with this commodity and submit to the spectacle? Are you gonna be? Are you gonna be what? Am I am I gonna am I gonna have an outpouring as a consumer of religious zeal? in honor of the commodity. 
Uh, like, uh, you mean, are you going to have a better deal? No, am I going to, am I going to have, you know, like, am I going to be passionate with the computer? Is it going to be a fad, a, a real... Um, trust me, um, the PowerBook was my first computer that I got on Apple when I started working here. And, uh, yes, I, uh, you're going to fall in love with that. Is there is no, uh, I haven't met anybody, anybody that doesn't fell in love with PowerBook. Am I going to become intimate with it? I mean, is... extremely intimate with it. Uh, you you have a hard time getting separated from it. Um, I cannot go out anywhere without my computer. Um, I mean, even when I come at work, I need to carry my computer around at school. I mean, very attached to it because everything is on there. I trust the computer because it is protected from viruses, from any kind of crashes or anything. So it's easily becoming your everyday companion. Like it is there. All right. Well, thank you for all your information. You're welcome, sir. Did you want to um, go decide on the purchase today, sir? No, I'm going to think about it. All right. So is there anything else that I could do for you today, sir? No, I think I'm set. All right. So in case you wanted to give me a call this week, I'm here until 6 p.m. Pacific time. Right now it's 5.59, so it's pretty much my time right now. Right, well, are, are you going to you're gonna go home? Uh, yeah, I'm going home in a minute. Do yeah. you, do you see, are you going to sit in front of your power book? I'm sorry? Are you going to sit in front of your power book? Um, well, now I just got the MacBook Pro, which is the new version of the PowerBook. Uh huh. So that's the one that I'm playing with right now. I see. All right. Well, maybe I'll, I should think about that one. <laughs> that one is the the ultimate machine, but yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Forty-five, automation, which is at once the most advanced sector of modern industry and the epitome of its practice confronts the world of the commodity with a contradiction that it must somehow resolve. The same technical infrastructure that is capable of abolishing labor must at the same time preserve labor as a commodity, and indeed as a sole generator of commodities. If automation, or for that matter any mechanisms, even less radical ones, that can increase productivity, are to be prevented from reducing socially necessary labor time to an unacceptably low level, new forms of employment have to be created. A happy solution presents itself in the growth of the tertiary, or service sector, in response to the immense strain on the supply lines of the army responsible for distributing and hyping the commodities of the moment. The coincidence is neat. On the one hand, the system is faced with the necessity of reintegrating newly redundant labor. On the other, the very factitiousness of the needs associated with the commodities on offer calls out a whole battery of reserve forces. The economy's triumph as an independent power inevitably also spells its doom, for it has unleashed forces that must eventually destroy the economic necessity 
that was the unchanging basis of earlier societies. Replacing that necessity by the necessity of boundless economic development can only mean replacing the satisfaction of primary human needs, now met in the most summary manner by a ceaseless manufacture of pseudo-needs, all of which come down, in the end, to just one, namely the pseudo-need for the reign of an autonomous economy to, to continue. Such an economy irrevocably breaks all ties with authentic needs, to the precise degree that it emerges from a social unconscious that was dependent on it without knowing it. Whatever is conscious wears out, whatever is unconscious remains unalterable. Once freed, however, surely this too must fall into ruins. 52. By the time society discovers that it is contingent on the economy, the economy has in point of fact become contingent on society. Having grown as a subterranean force until it could emerge sovereign, the economy proceeds to lose its power. Where economic id was, there ego shall be. The subject can only arise out of society, that is, out of the struggle that society embodies. The possibility of a subject's existing depends on the outcome of the class struggle, which in turns out to be the product and the producer of history's economic foundation. 53. Consciousness of desire and the desire for consciousness together and indissolubly constitute that project which in its negative form has as its goal the abolition of classes and the direct possession by the workers of every aspect of their activity. The opposite of this project is the society of the spectacle, where commodity com contemplates itself in a world of its own making. And now I'm supposed to say something deep. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm just going to go through 51, 52, 53, sort of why I think these three passages are fucking awesome, especially when you take them together. In 51, I really like the concept um, that capitalism has replaced genuine human needs with an almost endless supply of manufactured needs, um, needs that has created in people's minds that it then, like, you know, handily provides the satisfaction for through commodity. Um, and th that in the end, all of these, like, pseudo-needs mask the one super giant pseudo-need that capitalism should exist and continue to exist no matter what. Um, and that, the, like, capitalism doesn't exist in a vacuum. It creates a social and psychological institutions and, and ramifications and intonations that are inseparable from it as an economic system. And yeah, I've definitely noticed that like when I stopped relying on stores to provide me with what I need from life and went to like dumpsters or just hand-me-downs or just, you know, th different things like that. Um, I noticed that it was really exciting that I could get all this crap for free and was like really amazed at like all of the amazing stuff that's thrown out all the time or whatever. But then you get to the point where it's like, I don't want this shit. Like, this is actually just junk. Like, it shouldn't, it doesn't only just belong in the trash. Like, it should never have been made. And it was, you know, a recognition of my own pseudo need for crap. Um, it's still something I fight. Yes, it's true. But, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty clear example in my life of how I've noticed this thing at work. And then 52 is really, I think, really powerful. And maybe one of those important things to realize is that capitalism has distorted and transformed social life with by these pseudo needs and all the pseudo satisfaction of these needs and it's led to a system of alienation and commodification and all of that that keeps people apart and therefore it's like created a society that depends on the economy like we can't function in, as independence or as a social network without some level of commodification and alienation but at the same time because the economy has to rely on our alienation and commodification to do its dirty work, um, we it's like a Achilles heel for it. And when we like take real direct steps to end the alienation and to resist commodification and all of this, then we actually are attacking the um, not only the social system, but the economy. And that's really exciting for me. Um, yeah, and if just more people stopped using commodities to pseudo-satisfy pseudo pseudo-needs, it's the house of cards, I think in this case it's like credit cards, um, would come collapsing down, and uh, yeah, that's what I want, so. Um, 53, I really like the phrase consciousness of desire and the desire for consciousness, and I think 
the, the need to find in ourselves and in our friends and our lovers our real desires and our real needs and to like actively pursue their satisfaction in a real and direct way is really important. And um, I like the idea that it begins with some sort of, or it doesn't necessarily begin temporally, but at some point like you need to get in touch with your own desires and what you want out of life and what, what your life needs are. But then the next step is to see them in other human beings and to start realizing that your autonomy can only be a collective autonomy. And yeah, so to be conscious of your own desires and then desire consciousness of others' desires. And that's like the real project of de-alienating the world and attacking the economic system and all of this. So, and then, you know, the conclusion of that is that the the alternative to doing something like Gita Board is, is you know, promoting is just to live in a society of the spectacle where everything, our own desires, one another, our relationships, the world, economy, everything comes to us as like almost an observation and is separated from something that we have a real and active power to do something about. Fuck the society of the spectacle. It's The spectacle appears at once as society itself, as a part of society, and as means of unification. As a part of society, it is that sector where all attention, all consciousness converges. Being isolated, and precisely for that reason, this sector is the locus of illusion and false consciousness. The unity it imposes is merely the official language of generalized separation. 4. The spectacle is not a collection of images. Rather, it is the social relationships between people that is mediated by images. Recently, some friends and I have been giving out free food on the street corner outside, and to make it more interesting, we bring out jump ropes and a guitar and other things out there with us. Many people just walk by. Others stare for a little while and keep moving, and a small minority come and take some food or play games with us. Every once in a while, someone will stop to talk to us and ask us what we are doing. I tried to tell him that we were just friends out here to have fun with others in the neighborhood. Usually, that only confuses them. And someone else will say, we're food not bombs. This usually satisfies the person and they will go on their way. What I dislike about that interaction is when they hear food not bombs, they are at that point relating to the image of food not bombs and not to the people right in front of them. This is what the spectacle has created for us. A relationship with other people on the level of images, not as humans interacting. At that point, I feel like we are just something to be consumed, not truly experienced. One seventy two. Urbanism is the modern way of tackling the ongoing need to safeguard class power by ensuring the atomization of workers dangerously massed together by the conditions of urban production. The unremitting struggle that has had to be waged against the possibility of workers coming together in whatever manner has found a perfect field of action in urbanism. The effort of all established powers since the experience of the French Revolution to augment their means of keeping order in the street has eventually culminated in the suppression of the street itself, evoking a civilization moving along a one-way road. Lewis Mumford in The City in History points out that with the advent of long-distance mass communications, the isolation of the population has become a much more effective means of control. But the general trend toward isolation, which is the essential reality of urbanism, 
must also embody a controlled reintegration of the workers based on the planned needs of production and consumption. Such an integration into the system must recapture isolated individuals as individuals isolated together. Factories and cultural centers, holiday camps, and housing developments all are expressly oriented to the goals of a pseudo-community of this kind. These imperatives pursue the isolated individual right into the family cell, where the generalized use of receivers of the spectacle's message ensures that his isolation is filled with the dominant images, images that indeed attain their full force only by virtue of this isolation. When I was a kid in the town that I grew up in, there wasn't a lot of what I would call social space, or rather, the social spaces that did exist were designed in very specific ways. For instance, looking back, I realized that the only place where friends my age could really meet up and spend time together was the mall. So this is where we would go, not at all because we intended to shop, but because this was the only place where spending time with friends was even a possibility. Of course, thinking back, I realized that if the only place where it is possible to spend social time with friends is a mall, that is going to dramatically affect the type and character of the social time that you spend with one another. When I think about this now, and about how the shape of the environment continues to affect the shape of my life, it infuriates me. My environment really only leaves room for production or consumption, and that's not how I want my life to look. The concept of individuals being isolated together really resonates with me as well. I feel like I am very isolated from my neighbors and that they are likely isolated from each other as well. But it's interesting how well that isolation is masked by the images that we all receive and relate to. For instance, things like going to the movies are supposed to be social experiences. I can't imagine anything more isolating than a bunch of people silently staring at a screen in a dark room. But that isolation is pretty well concealed by the common language that it gives everyone there. For instance, my neighbors and I have lives that don't even begin to overlap. And yet, even though we have almost never spoken to each other, we all have a common sense of what we could talk to each other about. Since what's on TV, what sports team is winning, what movies are good, or what's being reported on around the world, all serve to smooth over how fractured our lives really are. Thanks for listening. Okay, okay just fucking hell, dude. Hey, thanks for listening to this edition of Audio Anarchy Radio. And check out more at audioanarchy.org. <laughs> <laughs>